Hi, everybody. Um, good evening. Uh, my name is Joel Winland, and I want to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me, Dee especially, for inviting me to uh, speak with you all tonight. Um, I, my plan is to um, speak for about um, 20 minutes, open it up for discussion, speak for another 20 minutes, and then open it up for final question and answer and back and forth. Um, my talk tonight is called uh, Ideology, Insidious Individualism and Insurrection, Angela Davis and the Critique of Racial Capitalism. Um, I want to, sorry, um, you speak uh, tonight uh, with a focus on these two texts, uh, Freedom is a Constant Struggle, which is her most recent book uh, published just last year, and then as well as look at some of the ideas in Women and Capitalism, Dialectics of Oppression and Liberation, which was published uh, in the 1970s. Um, Angela Davis's 1971 trial and its atmosphere of police and state um, repression may be seen as being at the end of something, perhaps the end of a radical era of militant struggles against racism, of working class militancy for liberation around gender and sexuality and the anti-war movement. I argue for seeing that wave of politically and racially motivated repression in a new way uh, as the opening of the neoliberal project. The confluence of a number of events, including the trial of Angela Davis, sh shows that the foundation of neoliberalism framed a successful effort by the U.S. ruling class to restore white supremacy, which achieved hegemony in part by gaining the willing consent of a majority of white voters. I want to think through how white supremacy and the neoliberal phase or stage of capitalism originated together, rearticulating anew the origins of capitalism and systemic racism. I will argue that these events culminated in the rise of Trumpism and will then read some of Angela Davis's theoretical and critical work with the goal of learning more about how to build an effective revolutionary resistance. Uh, my first point is uh, neoliberalism and white supremacy. Two recent articles published on left and liberal websites recently highlight the main point I wanna make tonight. A writer at vox.com argued that, quote, left-wing economics is not necessarily the entire answer to right-wing populism. In response, a writer at Jacobin accused the Vox.com writer of, quote, bad history. Essentially, the Vox.com writer argues European countries that had created strong social democratic policies saw big declines in popular support over the past couple of decades for the parties that implemented those programs. The essential issue is that voters in those countries grew angry and anxious about non-Christian, non-Western, non-white um, migration to their countries and fell prey to the rhetoric of right-wing racism, Islamophobia, xenophobia, and anti-Semitism. Political elites in those countries relied on that reactionary wave to implement neoliberal policies. The author argues that a similar result in the U.S fuels the Trump coalition. He writes, quote, the bigger issue is that America's welfare state is weak for the same fundamental reason that Donald Trump captured the Republican nomination in the first place, racial and cultural resentment. To support his argument, the author cites recent relevant data showing the depth of that resentment in the United States. For his part, the Jacobin writer responds by demanding a focus on the economic dimensions of social class as the primary way of understanding the American electorate in the 2016 election. In essence, he fails to re recognize the internet connection of racial capital capitalism and dismisses the Vox.com writer as bad history. The uh, Jacobin author argues this, quote, in short, Trump cannot simply have been caused by white supremacy because we have always had white supremacy. Does this author intend to mean that white supremacy is not a structural determinant of social relations because of its eternal inevitability? Apparently, only class as narrowly defined by its economic factors can explain social phenomena, despite capitalism's apparent eternal ine uh, inevitability. The Jacobin author claims coincide with numerous arguments posed by many well-known writers and websites on the left that argue rather consistently that the Democratic Party, Party's failures to abandon neoliberalism led to Donald Trump. In many cases, these writers narrowly define neoliberalism as economic policies and their effects and insist that support for Donald Trump results in, uh, results, 
uh, is driven by economic anxieties. Polit politics primarily based in racism and white supremacy are dismissed as meaningless. Effective right-wing political strategies such as voter suppression targeting people of color and gerrymandering that produces majorities for Republicans in Congress without achieving a majority of the popular vote are also underestimated. And you can see uh, famous writers like namely Klein, Chris Hedges, George Monbiot, Nancy Fraser, Michael Hudson, just to name a couple um, that I've put on the screen for you to browse. The Jockerman author seems to be aware of the ebbs and flows, zeniths, and what eminent African-American historian Rayford Logan calls nadirs of race relations. But I argue, following Davis, white supremacy cannot be thought of only as an eternally immutable phenomenon, endlessly sewn into the fabric of existence without alteration, and thus able to be discounted as something that really doesn't matter. Uh, such would be a questionable claim akin to the nonsense that radical economic alterations will naturally and automatically cure all non-economic social problems. My point is, white supremacy, like capitalism, like all social system, is made and remade by people and institutions. Specifically, white supremacy cannot be remade without white people and their particular relationship to it and to power. Yes, some white people have more power than others, and the blueprints for those structures are handed down uh, like brown eyes and cleft chins and uh, inherited trust funds. For these reasons, white supremacy in the United States in 2017 isn't identical to white supremacy in 1776. And that leads me to the point I want to make about the life of Angela Davis and the emergence of neoliberalism as a hegemonic, multidimensional strategy in the moments of her imprisonment. Her arrest and subsequent trial, combined with threats to her life and livelihood by some of the most powerful men in the world, were not simply the arbitrary rantings of angry white men like Ronald Reagan or Richard Nixon. Something much bigger was happening. In her recent book, From Black Lives Matter to Black Liberation, socialist-oriented African-American scholar and activist Kianga Yamada Taylor describes the Nixon administration as an agent of reaction. After several years during which the black liberation struggle spread and grew more radical and militant, it deepens its transformation of the terrain of political action and possible struggle. For example, uh, Taylor identifies the Johnson-appointed Kerner Commission in 1968, which pointed to institutional racism as the cause of unrest and revolt in U.S. cities in the 1960s. Can you imagine today a U.S. government commission blaming institutional racisms for things like police violence, job discrimination, or uneven access to quality education? Uh, it would only do so if the terrain of struggle had shifted enough to make that kind of language intelligible to most people. In addition to the black liberation movement, the social movements of people of color generally, the anti-war movement, the growth of women's liberation, and the intensification of worker militancy created in the late 1960s and early 1970s, an era defined by broad struggle and demands for structural changes. Not anything new I'm saying here, I don't think. In a broader context, left and labor movements globally had vigorously challenged the class power of the capitalist classes beginning in the 1930s. In the US, this massive struggle solidified into major progress by the 1950s with about 35% of the labor force organized, a living minimum wage, limits on working hours, a country on the verge of national health care, uh, a progressive income tax on millionaires, millionaire incomes, sections of the political elite who espouse devotion to working class and its powerful institutions, and new openings in the struggle against Jim Crow led by a radical and uh, racially diverse left. In some, the era proved to be a time of tremendous anxiety for white corporate and bourgeois elites. They needed to restore their brand of order. Eminent scholars like Manning Marable in his book, How Capitalism Underdeveloped Black America, uh, which pu was published in 1983, even though he doesn't use the term neoliberalism in that book, has helped to craft this kind of narrative about what was happening in the 1970s about this particular moment in U.S. history. Following Marable, Taylor pushes the date of the beginning of the neoliberal project from Reagan, which is, I think, commonplace, back to Nixon, um, back to the late 1960s. She notes that Nixon's, the Nixon administration's tough on crime policies, its attempt to identify social welf welfare policies with African Americans who systematically, who he systematically, but without overt racial language, labeled as undeserving and his ideological efforts to demobilize public support for collective solutions to social problems, which were the hallmark of the uh, Great Society and the New Deal, um, were under attack. 
Taylor makes an important argument, but she doesn't fully identify the production of neoliberal policies as a racial project designed to restore white supremacy. She sees it primarily as producing racist effects. In the bigger picture, the, she draws a parallel between neoliberalism in the 1970s and the primitive accumulation projects in British North America in the colonial period. So she jumps back in time um, to sh make a comparison. She makes a special point, however, to argue that the central aim of each, the origins of capitalism and neoliberalism in the 20th century, um, the central aim of each was the production of commodities for profit. White supremacy was merely in effect. In the end, she keeps white supremacy and the economic policies of the neoliberal project distinct, except in their consequences, and emphasizes a more fundamental causal importance to the latter, to the economic, to capitalism, um, like our friends at Jacobin and multiple other authors I've cited above. I want to argue for more explicit connections between the two systems, racial and capitalist systems, what Davis calls interpenetration. Um, users of the term neoliberalism, when they feel compelled to do so, which is not often, um, generally define it as a political economic strategy de developed in the latter portions of the 20th century designed to restore the fullest power of the cap capitalist class through coordinated tax on organized labor, restructuring of economic activity to enhance precarious work, massive funding cuts to public institutions, ideological attacks on those public institutions uh, as a means of engendering equality, the militarization of the economy, and a systematic integration of local and regional markets into global markets and commodity chains using uh, instruments of free trade. I want to emphasize also that neoliberal policies taken together constitute a racial project, a racist project, a white supremacist response to black brown liberation and what white elites call the politics of fragmenting identities. And Davis's arrest and trial were maneuvers in that project. Put another way, the need to restore white supremacy during an upsurge in black and people of color liberation struggles constituted neoliberalism. Thus, to render neoliberalism as only or primarily an economic project is to participate in the colorblind racial project that neoliberalism initiated in the first place. Um, so I want to move to the work of uh, theoretical work of Angela Davis and the, and the current moment to sort of look through some of these ideas more carefully. In her essay, Women in Capitalism, Dialectics of Oppression and Liberation, which was published in uh, the 1970s, it was written in prison, published in the 1970s, and was republished in 2000 as part of the book, The Angela Davis Reader. So if you want to find it, you can find it there. Um, Davis deploys a Marxist analysis of Marxist theory itself to understand the, quote, interpenetration of oppressive systems. Her essay touches on the racist dimensions of capitalist development, but it mainly focuses on how a gendered division of labor helped to shape its capitalist development. I believe that by studying the development of uh, Davis's argument here, we can learn more about the supposed incompatible duality of class politics and what some people dismiss as identity politics, as well as wield some useful theoretical tools for understanding neoliberalism as a racist project and for reshaping how we imagine struggle and liberation. Davis builds that theory by making the case for understanding, quote, the mutual interpenetration of ostensibly unrelated modes of oppression, such as heteronormative patriarchy, racism, imperialism, and class exploitation. Following Marx, Davis shows that in the early stages of capitalist development, that is prim primitive accumulation, in the abstract, people who have been usually organized in localized households or communities were separated from the means of, subs uh, means of subsistence in favor of social production organized within a space controlled and owned by capitalists. To survive, workers sell their labor power for a wage based on the socially necessary labor time in, uh, needed to produce the commodities they make. If this abstract process mirrored real life precisely, capitalism should have produced an egalitarian effect on the working class. Davis writes this, quote, as a person, the worker would be superfluous to production. Only his abstract ability to work would be pertinent. Yet, even in this contingency, he could also discover beneficial features for which 
uh, for, with the notable exception of racism, caste-like distinctions should not interfere when he sold his labor power on the market. The capitalist commodity is totally indifferent to the origins of, of the labor which produces it. I want to repeat that. The capitalist commodity is totally indifferent to the origins of the labor which produces it. Labor becomes abstract labor power, and each worker of similar skills should uh, always be equal to the next." End quote. This leveling of workers to units of abstract labor should have resulted in a process of equalization, where distinctions of gender or race or, or citizenship discrimination um, um, associated with types and products of labor should have vanished. So why didn't it work out like that in real life? Why does racist and gender-based discrimination as well as citizenship-based discriminations in labor markets ensure that one subordinate group earns less than the next, produces structurally determined subordinate workforce positions, and secures fewer public resources for socially necessary goods and benefits? If capitalist development supposedly produces abstract labor and cares nothing for the personness or the social identity of the worker. Davis points to, quote, a peculiarly society phenomenon, end quote, apart from capitalist development and which expresses itself as an extra economic determinant that created the possibility and necessity of racism and sexism as conditioners of the value of labor. While, quote, the capitalist mode of production outstrips all previous modes in transcending virtually all extra economic determinants, end quote, in the case of these two social systems, it did not for peculiarly social historical reasons. As it turns out, capitalism could not let go of those forms of oppression. It could not. Particularly, women's oppression defied the above stated logic of abstract labor because, quote, their oppression is indeed a result of critical social forces in whose absence the mode of production could not effectively be sustained, end quote. In other words, the necessities of material relations outweighed the push of abstract logic. Because the uh, family as a unit of production in pre-capitalist relations tended to, to, be, to divide labor by gender, Davis argues, that division was preserved in the industrial capitalist era in order to provide a separate domain apart from social production. Tying women to the domestic sphere in the new period as well, or in the case of working women, to the dual words, worlds of public and privately exploited labor. All of this was justified by an ideology that proclaimed a natural order in which women's labor is considered part of her biological identity and that her primary function is as a biological extension of the male anatomy and masculine identity. Of course, this material and ideological system did not account for the reality of non-gender binary individuals or non-heteronormative familial relations. So how then does the supposed production of abstract units of labor explain racism? If commodities don't care who makes them, why would the racial identities or citizenship status or religious affiliation of the, of the person making them uh, matter so intensely? Thinking about this essay in relation to the emergence of neoliberalism, I want to deploy this theoretical work to shift the focus to the relationship of racism in the form of white supremacy and capitalism. Davis doesn't address the origins of the relation of racial slavery to capitalist development in the same way that she explores the connection of gender oppression and capitalism, capitalism's origins, but she does draw out how African descended people were structured within capitalism as enslaved laborers, but excluded from the idealized family relations intended to serve the reproduction of the laborer and the system. Davis more carefully analyzes this aspect of the development of heteronormative patriarchy under capitalism in her essay, also written about the same time, um, called Reflections on the Black Women's Role in the Community of Slaves. <coughs> her analysis of this process significantly begins by identi identifying an or originating logic, neoliberal logic the definition of the African-American family as a pathologically failed social institution. And so what I want to see um, that idea as an, or, uh, a point at which a, a logic or an ideology that helps to form, helps to constitute the neoliberal pro project. Um, and that thesis about the African-American family was first published in the now infamous 1965 Moynihan Report. So that's 1965. 
That study, with its pretense of academic scholarship, established the myth of the black matriarch as the source of that failure, driving subsequent stereotypes of African American women as domineering on one hand and as welfare cheats on, on the other. Underlying this ideological appeal to African American cultural inferiority lay the denial of the agency of African American women and men who refused to accept the traditional heteronormative patriarchal model of man-headed households, echoed in what Davis calls, quote, varied, often heroic responses of African American women to the slaveholders' domination. So there's a tradition of exploitation and oppression as well as a tradition of resistance. Even further, in the 1970s and 1980s, African-American responses to deindustrialization, rising unemployment, urban crisis fueled by white flight, declines in resources for public education, unevenly developed healthcare systems, massive influxes of drugs, diseases, and other public health crises are nothing short of heroic, writes Davis. In an essay uh, co-authored with her sister, Fania Davis, the two reference a study showing that in addition to the permanent loss of more than uh, more than 11 million jobs in industrial production which working class black households depended on in the period leading up to the mid-1980s. The militarization of the US federal budget and the economy as a whole cost black people quote 1300 jobs for every increase during the uh, I'm sorry for each increase of 1 billion in the military budget. The military budget exploded during the war in Vietnam and with Reagan's intensification of the Cold War. Meanwhile, rollbacks in welfare, education spending, and healthcare funding, along with massive tax cuts for the 1% and powerful corporations, exploded the crisis suffered by millions of working class people in order to restore the hegemony and power of the 1%. In this crisis, the family became an ideological tool of the powerful. Heteronormative patriarchal familial forms under capitalism were used as institutional myths to preserve the haven for idealized working males. This fantasy supported the adherence to patriarchal practices, which, as Davis has shown in her book, Women, Race, and Class, has historically ensured a cross-class solidarity among whites, aimed at the dehumanization of the entirety of African American people, working to preserve slavery and its subsequent forms not simply as a production system, but as a system of white supremacy. Um, the cultural role of the family dovetailed well with neoliberalism, continuing the cultural custom of dehumanizing black people while attacking public institutions that fought poverty. It fostered a contempt for material kinship relations among African Americans and encouraged the elimination of public institutions that could be blamed as a cause of those relations, like welfare. It further proved useful in sustaining the projection of a myth of an African-American cultural breakdown as a source of criminality and crisis generally, and to promote the creation of mass incarceration institutions such as prisons, as well as the institutionalized school-to-prison pipeline. Truly pathological, however, has been the public's response to the structural crisis of capitalism and the neoliberal agenda. Individuals and families in the dominant political discourse became the cause of economic and social crises rather than their effect. And I know I'm making a big generalization that many will resist, but whites, especially those who formed and still form the overwhelming majority of the right-wing voting bloc in the United States, responded not by supporting the social democratic uh, policies of Jesse Jackson in the 1980s or the fundamentally economically oriented Income and Jobs Action Act 1985 sponsored by uh, Representative John Conyers. Um, they too often responded by resisting those economic solutions to the crisis of capitalism, capitalism in favor of aligning with heavily racialized appeals to family function, individualism, suburban life, segregation, middle class culture, and law and order. And it is since Nixon that this voting bloc has grown increasingly culturally and racially homogeneous. In other words, broadly social democratic, even socialist economic solutions to neoliberalism didn't win hegemony in American politics in the last decades of the 20th century. And I propose this fact may have something to do with the personness, the social identities of the communities and the leaders advocating those policies. If we look at American history, we can see similar episodes in which the insurgency of white supremacy interwove itself necessarily with the nature of capitalist development. For example, I'm going to look at 1776 and 1876 briefly. 
Indeed, when we examine the development of racism in light of capitalist relations, neither whiteness, maleness, nor blackness, nor femaleness, or other social identities should carry weight in the labor market if we insist on the abstract unit of labor concept. But clearly those aspects of personness did matter from the moment of capitalist inception in British North America. As scholars such as Barbara Fields, Helen Scott, Ronald Takaki, and Gerald Horn have shown, there was a compulsive demand for enslaved labor in the form of black bodies stolen from Africa combined with a campaign to define racial privilege and oppression based on highly arbitrary are arbitrary and contradictory uh, categories of physical difference. This scholarship shows that if the labor system and the source of profit in British North America and in numerous colonized settler societies in Latin America and the Caribbean and Africa had developed using the abstract labor unit model, capitalism and colonial projects would have easily collapsed due to lack of profitability that offset the deadly dangers involved. Noted historian Gerald Horn develops the argument further in his book, The Counter-Revolution of 1776. Uh, the contradictions of inter-imperialist rivalry, the demand for economic development in the British Isles, and the growing expenditure in lives and treasure to suppress insurrections by enslaved people drove British policy toward free labor. The tangible sign of laborers as abstract units. Irrationally, uh, North American colonists defied that trend toward abolition with the demand to expand the institution of racial slavery for the sake of capitalist process, pros, profit, necessitating a break with England in 1776. Horn reads the revolution as involving two key factors, the preservation of racial slavery and the formation of white supremacy as the cornerstone of the power structure needed to preserve that labor system. Shifting the historical experience a century later to 1876, W.E.B. Du Bois in his groundbreaking work, Black Reconstruction in America, reminds us of the revolutionary nature of radical reconstruction and its promise of, quote, abolition democracy. Setting the decade after the close of the Civil War against, in contrast against the massive uh, reaction and erection of white supremacy at the heart of the American Revolution. Freedom in radical reconstruction posed a threat to white supremacy, obviously, and to, but I also want to add two particular forms of capitalist development. Permanent and systematic policies such as South Carolina's uh, constitutional mandate for land redistribution deserve scrutiny to understand this uh, connection. Federal law mandated that in order for states to be readmitted to the Union after the Civil War, they had to not only adopt the new federal constitution, uh, constitutional amendments forbidding enslavement uh, for equal rights and due process, black citizenship, and black male voting rights. In addition, states had to pass state constitutions recognizing those laws. Du Bois shows that in the case of South Carolina, most white vo voters uh, boycotted that election in protest, while 70,000 black men voted in favor of new reconstruction laws. This action created a constitutional convention comprised mainly of African-American male leaders. There they organized a new constitution that included a land commission to oversee the state's acquisition of land from plantation owners, many who were devastated by the loss of thousands of capital due to the end of slavery. According to Eric, uh, historian Eric Foner, some 14,000 households in South Carolina, mostly but not exclu exclusively black, were able to purchase low-cost, low-interest homesteads under this land commission. And when we study uh, what those farmers did uh, in the 1870s, how they organized their economic activity, it is evident that they um, threatened an alternative economic development that resisted plantation um, uh, capitalism. Um, and when we think about the reaction to that new uh, reconstruction period, we understand that um, there was a confluence of uh, restoring capitalist development in a certain way, controlled by a certain class, that also uh, conjoined with the re-establishment, restoration of white supremacy. So I want to sort of use those two historical examples as precursors for understanding how neoliberalism works in the 1960s. So I want to pause there. I'm about halfway through. I don't want to pause there um, for questions. So if you have questions, I've been told that you should use your raised hand icon to ask a question, and then um, your mic will be opened and you will be able to ask your question or make your comment. <laughs> 
Okay, if you have a question or comment, please use your raised hand icon. Just click the image of the hand and I'll be able to open your mic. Alex Giovanoni, your mic is open. All right, thank you everyone um, who is involved in putting this event together. Thank you very much, Joel. Um, I think you are making a very excellent argument. Um, I think this is a really great educational talk. And um, my only comment is that I think that this should be made publicly available um, on YouTube or whatever because it you're, you're making a very compelling and clear case and a great argument. And um, I'm really enjoying this and I'm learning a lot as well. So thank you. Thank you. Use your raised hand icon and we can... Open your mic. I'm looking through. Just click your raised hand icon if you have comment or a question. Now, a few people have written their questions and comments. Um, I can't see those. So. I know. Okay. Um, okay. So I'll go back. Please use your raised hand icon to indicate uh, you want to verbally present your question or comment. Okay, I don't see any raised hands at this point. All right, well, I'll proceed and then maybe I can um, address. Is, there is one, okay. Okay, go ahead. Lowell, Lowell, your mic is open. Thank you. Thank you, Joel, for this um, talk. Um, I guess one of the things that kept going through the back of my mind as you were speaking is, are you aware of something a little controversial called the, I think it's called the Crest Theory of Racism? I or, am not aware of that. I'm not, I'm not sure um, about that. Uh, could you give more context? Okay. I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not fully schooled on it. Uh, Francis Press Welsing was a, I believe, a black psychologist who developed a theory um, which kind of goes behind the question I was trying to ask is that um, she believed that a lot of this, um, the racial conflict that I think you're talking about um, that's inherent in capitalism is, is coming from white's fear of disappearing. That that fear of disappearing is greater to the white population than any other ideology like capitalism or um, let's say the social improvement to someone like Jesse Jackson or Conyers as you alluded to might have proposed and why they would have resisted that, that, that white people are a minority on this planet and they are in their DNA, I, I believe she has said, are, um, are afraid of being made extinct. And so their primary um, impulse is, is self-preservation and capitalism and neoliberalism or the preceding liberalism are just secondary. Um, uh, that's an interesting um, framing of that question. Um, I don't know about that sp specific um, uh, theoretical approach. I do know that there are lots of psychological uh, explanations for racism. Um, I would hesitate to advance them as um, uh, as psychological explanations, as overarching explanations, I think um, that those play a role definitely in how uh, many of us who are white um, view our place in the world. Um, there are studies that show that um, when you ask uh, white people uh, 
um, about the population of people of color in the United States, they will overestimate the number of people of color by large exaggerated amounts. Uh, when I ask my students, for example, uh, what they think the ratio of, of white students and to students of color on our campus is, um, they will often over exaggerate the number by really large uh, amounts. Um, and, and there is, so there is a lot of uh, ways to analyze uh, racial attitudes psychologically, and I and I think those are often valuable uh, research. That's often valuable research and um, valuable studies. But um, I think um, we have to think about these things as operating, not as primary or causal, um, so much as operating in particular contexts. So um, those things can change. I think. Um, I think it's um, important to understand that those psychologies can change. Um, I don't want to get into t discussing things like implicit bias, which is also another psychological study. Um, I, I will save that for a different um, occasion. But um, it, in terms of psychological explanations of racism, I would say um, that they operate within particular contexts, particular articulations um, of white supremacy that have to do with a whole series of social systemic and institutional practices that are in place. Um, and and in, in the next section, I'm going to talk about how sometimes those get called up. Um, those historical uh, psychologies get called up to perform particular functions uh, for white supremacy. So I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, but um, I don't want to. I, I don't want to um, uh, talk too much uh, here. Um, but if there are other questions or other comments, Norma, your mic is open. Hi. So um, it's been difficult for me to follow uh, some of the content of what you said because it's. Uh, I'm slow thinking, but I'm going back to my thinking on the subject. Uh, that I, th I think is relevant to what you're saying. Um, I've long thought that uh, there's a, a holy trinity, W-H-O-L-L-Y. We're taught that social and economic and uh, what's the other word? Social, economic, and uh, golly, I'm, I'm really on the edge here with... Uh, Cultural, ideological... No, uh, anyway, are, are, are separate things. I say if you don't have bread, that's, that's social, that's economic, that's, that's the whole composite. And, and there's a third one in there. I have to write it back to you what it is. Okay. That's amazing because I, it's a mantra I constantly recite. I don't see that. And, and so I see all the... Uh, uh, insanity that depri derives from the economic, what's called the economic oppression, but it's that whole um, behave, that whole aspect of suppression for the sake of profit of the few, the profit and power of the few white uh, owners of the world and not a, uh, a separate kind of uh, uh, assortment of well, it's economic. Well, it's social. Well, it's cultural, so forth. I don't know. Um, I think I think I I think I hear you arguing that those things uh, work together. Um, I, I would say that if we if we uh, lack bread, if a person lacks bread, um, and we only see that as an economic or a social phenomenon, we don't see it as an ideological one or a cultural one, we can't really a answer the question, why does that person who lacks the bread sometimes say, it's my fault that I lack bread? So why do they sometimes say, um, at least I um, am not, I'm not like those people over there who are criminals and gangsters and um, abuse their babies and uh, spread diseases. Um, why do they, you know, why do they say, yes, it's okay for the people who make the bread to um, earn profits at my expense, right? And so we have to, if we're going to understand why people uh, come to the, you know, come to the table thinking in those ways, we have to think about, I think, um, the social, economic, cultural, political, ideological operating um, on people um, and and people actually performing them. Uh, I don't want to just see people as simply exploited and unable to think for themselves, um, but as people who willingly consent uh, to those. And when you say to them, 
uh, why don't you have red? Is it their fault? They'd say, yes, it's their fault, um, but not the capitalists. It's, the, it's another worker. Um, so, so we have to address those questions. And I, th and I think that's what Davis is doing in this work. She's trying to understand, work through uh, theoretically thinking about what causes people to um, take those positions um, and it, in, in such large enough numbers to produce white supremacy, to produce gender oppression along with and to make them necessary components of how capitalism develops. Um, so, th um, so I think that's an important way to, to the important question to raise. Are there others or should I move on? Uh, one more. Uh, uh, you, you need to unmute yourself. Cindy, unmute yourself and your mic will be open. There you are. Hi, thank you. Um, it's just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm loving following this thought, um, but it seems to me that the party then is not doing enough to support a black nationalism, black self-determination. And this may be where you're going in the second half, so I'll sign off with that. It's not, it's not precisely where I'm going. Um, I, I think those conclusions about what um, the Communist Party should do or what other social movements should do um, are, you know, what specific uh, organizations should do. It's not really where I'm going with this, but um, um, I guess I want us to think about some of those questions. Um, so I'll proceed if I should. Uh, one more. Jaheem, your mic is up. You need to unmute your mic. Jaheem, unmute your mic and your mic is open. Okay, why don't you go on? Okay, um, so uh, the second half is uh, I want to uh, look at the concept of insidious individualism that Davis discusses and uh, proceed to think about some of those larger movement questions. Um, so can we defeat the ideology of individualism? At the heart of the neoliberal racial project lies the cancer of what she calls insidious individualism. Nurtured on the capitalist mythology of the abstract unit of labor, the pathological, quote, society composed of fragmented individualism lacking any organic or human connection is held as ideal. Davis shows that because workers are trapped in capitalist social, social relations of production, they are, quote, transfigured into isolated private individuals, isolated from the means of production, hence from the means of subsistence, and equally isolated from the community of producers. Further, this individualist alienation fundamentally alters how workers view themselves. They are able only to see their own, quote, social relations as the nexus of exchange binding commodity to commodity. Identities themselves appear to be the result of acquisition and display of commodities. White middle class nuclear families purchase homes and suburbs, cars, big TVs, furniture, and send their children to good schools, all of which have to be paid for with private resources, usually on credit. They worry about crime, buy security systems, demand politicians lower their taxes, and express concerns about the trouble of the inner cities, mainly to contrast their own lives with urban others. In this way, white racial identity intersects with insidious individualism. Individualist mythology is exploited then to render collective solutions to social problems as marginal, or expensive, or inefficient, or even as un-American, and racially and culturally other. State monopoly capitalism produces clear social problems, but only the costs and risks are socialized for the people at large in order to produce private profits for corporations. Trump's proposed border wall with Mexico exempl exemplifies this problem. A debt crisis manufactured by speculation fueled plum plummeting oil prices in the early 1980s severely crippled numerous emergent developing economies such as Mexico, which had relied on oil prices to fund uh, social democratic policies. As a result, the international entities that would ultimately form the Washington Consensus by the 1990s forced Mexico to restructure its economy and land reform policies, privatize public institutions, and shift economic production from import substitution to export 
uh, to export. On top of that, NAFTA, contradicted by huge non-free trade policies or subsidies for U.S. agriculture, led to a severe employment crisis in Mexico, resulting in mass migrations internally and externally. Except, essentially, neoliberalism was being exported uh, to Mexico and Central America. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, so the migration crisis explodes, and naturally many million, millions of those would seek survival in the biggest economic market in the region, in the United States. While many business elites in the U.S. sought to profit from the influx of a marginalized reserve army of labor, xenophobic right-wing elements feared a decline in U.S. cultural identity, uh, white, Protestant, uh, English-only cultural dominance as they saw it, and they pushed them itself for the xenophobic uh, grouping bloc pushed itself forward as the ascendant voice of the Republican Party. Rational calls for solidarity, rights, and organization as the most viable strategies for defending all workers um, failed to win the majority's favor. Instead, a racist, xenophobic backlash blaming migrant workers for corporate and government policies they have zero control over dominated and still dominate the discourse. Thus, a wall. And the racist, divisive, xenophobic, scapegoating building blocks of that discourse are divulged further when the corporations who have supported Trump in the hopes of profiting from building such a wall are surfaced. Major multinationals like Geo Group, a subsidiary of the Mammoth Security Corporation, G4S, lobbied Trump and Congress for contracts for the border wall, for immigration detention centers, and expanded and privatized uh, immigration enforcement. Their profits for what amounts to a massive boondoggle coincide with xenophobic and racist-inspired responses to migration within the larger neoliberal framework. One Texas state, state legislature, legislator recently admitted that Geo Group also co-wrote a bill he proposed in Texas to reclassify immigration prisons as child care centers in order to increase the length of time that immigrant women and children could be legally detained. Davis explores developments such as these connecting international events with localized events. Indeed, in Chapter 4 of Freedom is a Constant Struggle, Davis provides a running thread through neoliberalism, ideologies of individualism, global corporate structures, U.S. racial policies, U.S. foreign policies, and the U.S. education system. Um, let me read just a little bit here. Uh, G4S, Group 4 Security, which is the owner of Geo Group, uh, which according to foreign policy has over 600,000 employees worldwide, making it the largest private security firm in the world, is especially important because it participates directly and blatantly in the maintenance and reproduction of re repressive apparatuses in Palestine, prison prisons, checkpoints, the, the apartheid wall, to name only a few examples. G4S uh, represents the growing insistence on what is called security under the neoliberal state and ideologies of security that bolster not only the privatization of security but the privatization of imprisonment, the privatization of warfare, as well as the privatization of healthcare and education. I feel like I'm kind of running out of time. Uh, it's 847 and I have a few more pages, um, but I definitely want to um, have room for more discussion if necessary. So I'm going to uh, try to talk for a little bit to try to summarize some of my main points and then uh, reopen the floor for discussion, further discussion. Um, Davis argues that current structures and practices of oppression are made possible because they have their origins in slavery laws and institutional racism. While the present is not identical to the past, there survives a continuity of structural and ideological racism in those institutions of oppression. Today, even though they present as colorblind, they remain inextricably tied to the particular history of slavery and white supremacy. Indeed, they can be called upon and enacted with appeals to racism, especially if coded in non-racist terms. Think, for example, of Richard Nixon's appeal to the silent majority in their suburban homes who he expected to be tired of black unrest and insurrection, echoed in Donald Trump's appropriation of matching slogans last year. Interwoven with this web of connections and the historical recurrence of new articulations of white supremacy is the relationship between profits and the popular cultural obsession with insecurity. 
fear and terror. If Americans, for example, believe they're always potentially victims of crime, believe perpetrators arise inevitably from certain populations and remain deluded by an ideology of individualism, they will likely support policies that promote heavy police presence, lots of prisons and criminalization rather than dealing with serious social problems like unemployment, poverty, or poor educational opportunities. They may never see themselves as racist, but they still may blame the victims of social problems as the cause of those social problems and support the ability of private corporations to make profits by incarcerating more and more people because they consent to the notion that private corporations can do prisons better than government. Davis em Davis's emphasis on constructed criminality, uh, mass incarceration, walls, border security, and detention serves to show the internal nature and contradictions of the individualist ideology and its relation to the material practices of systemic uh, racism. Davis writes, quote, neoliberal ideology drives us to focus on individuals, ourselves, individual victims, individual perpetrators. But as she has long argued, the nature of capitalist production invites fragmentation and isolation and shifts the natural human, quote, yearning for non-reified human relations from the arenas of social production and civil society to privatized spheres and internal life. Neoliberalism offers only a more intense version of this privatization. This insularity is virtually complete, she writes. Because capitalism is the most advanced form of social pathology disrupting human identity and relation, relations, creates conditions in which, quote, the human being has been severed from nature and thus from their own inorganic body, giving rise to a non-identity between humanity and its essence. Thus, Thus the practice of reified human relations. The pinnacle of, of human connection, bonding, community solidarity, the presumed essence of the ideal familial life can only exist in rationed form in isolated space. The space, however, is still fraught with contradictions punctuated by interventions of commodity fet fetishism. Um, and um, I'm going to pause there and um, s sort of try to summarize a little bit of my r remaining argument and suggest that um, Davis is arguing that um, what we call identity politics are identities as persons, as uh, people of color, as people who are white, people who are male, uh, female, transgender, or non-gender binary, uh, etc., are straight or gay or uh, etc. Though, though that personness, those aspects of our social identities cannot be separated from the workerness of us. Um, and uh, so she's saying that we don't need to shed ourselves of those identities, but see that see our liberation within those identities as part of a democratic struggle, a democratic struggle that weakens capitalism, weakens its hold over, weakens its ideological hold over people, weakens its um, profitability, uh, and forces the uh, uh, potential for uh, contradictions that could result in transformations. Davis's view of democratic struggle as a necessary basis for anti-capitalist and revolutionary consciousness, which despite her personal prominence hasn't secured a similar prominent theoretical stature in the Marxist or socialist or radical left, requires a movement of movements to address the immediate and the long term the sufficient and the necessary, the ideological and the structural. The Jacobin writer I mentioned above uh, exemplifies the leftist, leftist tendency uh, to define a radical identity by an emphasis on economic struggle. Strategic thinking, a democratic unity of anti-fascist forces and the possibility of social progress in a regressive period require a theoretical and practical balance of civil society, the ideological and the economic. Each play a role in sustaining the hege hege hegemony of the ruling class and its political bloc and the institutional and structural reproduction of capitalism and white supremacy and the slipping but still dangerous role of U.S. imperialism in the world. And so I'll stop there and open the floor for the last couple of minutes. I'm sorry for taking up so much time. Um, if you have a question or a comment, you should click your raised hand icon and the unmute your mic. Okay, click your raised hand. Okay. Gary uh, Mueller, your mic is, you need to unmute your mic yourself. There you are. Thank you so much. Hi. 
Uh, thank you so much. It was fascinating. I hope I can get this point across. Um, I have recently discovered a television show on PBS called Victorian Slum House. The basic idea behind it is that modern day people go and live as they did in uh, Victorian times in the slum area. One of the most fascinating aspects that I found of this show is you see the literal development of prejudices, everything from economic prejudices to racial prejudices, literally developing within the people who are acting in this um, scenario. Um, people whose economic uh, situations are better than others, getting to the point where they can employ others. You hear within their conversation uh, their dramatic need to um, almost villainize those people who are starting to uh, work for them. And, uh, um, and I don't know what uh, the future shows hold, but it's like a little conceptualized situation of watching uh, the, uh, the worst aspects of capitalism developing right before your very eyes. That's an interesting example. Um, uh, I think uh, there have been numerous um, uh, TV experiments. I, reality TV in general may 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 operate that way. Um, numerous uh, psychological experiments uh, conducted that show uh, a tendency among people. And and I think I think it 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 emerges from this idea that that Davis argues that we're we see ourselves as isolated individuals and that we are uh, have to be out to even if we're just playing a game right uh, that we have to be out for ourselves and that um, um, our interests are in hurting somebody else and and I think that plays a big role in some of the things that we, I've been talking about tonight and some of the things that people have been commenting about um, in their in their remarks yeah Thanks. Max Max, your your mic is open. Max. Um. Uh. So, we talk about racism and sexism being as uh, terrible issues, but do you think that we should maybe have cultural hatred to be like on that level of of oppression? Like when I talk about cultural hatred, I mean like hatred towards Latino people and Hispanic people, especially. Uh, Mexican-Americans, that we should uh, be more aware of cultural oppression to them than we are now. Do you agree? Um, yeah, I think that um, Americans, people who are living in this particular time who are um, being manipulated by um, Donald Trump and his rhetoric of anti-Latino, uh, anti-immigrant um, politics and policies, we should be aware. We should be aware of those things and we should um, be aware that it is driven by cultural and racial hatred and that it is um, uh, um, part of what, uh, part of some of these um, uh, histories of white supremacy that um, are trying to sort of reemerge, to re-establish uh, um, the power of the ruling class and so on and so forth. But that's, yeah, that's the way we fight against that. We be aware of it. We be aware of those cultural hatreds. Not all, not all of these hatreds are, can be easily defined as racial uh, because, um, uh, but they are linked in, in particular ways. And, and it, by being aware of them and by being aware of how they might be part of our own lives, uh, how we might be reinforcing them ourselves, um, by maybe not addressing them or, or just keeping our um, anti-racism to ourselves and not being part of an organized movement. Um, uh, that's, that's how we defeat it. And so, yeah, I think that's a good point that you have to be aware of those, um, those kinds of hatreds that are, that are just, that are being um, put forth in, in American society. Jaheem. Your mic, you need to unmute your mic yourself. Wilder, you're open. Okay. We're talking about racism. There is another kind of racism. There is legislative racism. Legislative racism, I believe, is 
like what Donald Trump is doing. He's putting the Mexicans and all other types of immigrants out, and he's using legislative racism. And when people try to make a stand for that, they're terrorists as he calls them in their bad hombres. And I wonder, do you agree that Donald Trump is using legislative racism for his power? Absolutely. Um, as I understand what you're saying, it, it sounds like um, you're, you're using that term to define uh, uh, legal policies, uh, laws, or other kinds of policies, say uh, say an executive order, that doesn't necessarily um, uh, overtly say racism, but it actually targets a particular population. Meanwhile, the the people in the Republican Party are saying, no, no, we're not racist. No, we're not racist. Um, if you look at Donald Trump's uh, recent budget, one of the things that they are calling it is a taxpayer first budget, right? And that doesn't seem like uh, racial language. But if you look at Republican Party discourse, uh, right wing discourse over the last couple of decades with the emergence of neoliberalism, taxpayer in their mind is equal to white middle class or upper class person. They don't uh, they, they tend to identify uh, people of color, working class people, poor people, as people who don't pay taxes, right? And so this is this taxpayer first concept is a white people concept, right? And it is, if, if I understand what you're, what you're saying about legislative racism um, uh, in, in the context that you used it, um, that, that budget would be uh, uh, that kind of thing, legislative racism aimed at harming um, uh, the majority of uh, the aimed at harming the you know majority of workers, but also targeting using codes, racial codes to um, rally white support for policies that will harm them too, most likely, right? Um, um, many white people need uh, welfare more. Uh, in fact, there's a higher number, higher percentage, higher proportion of whites who get welfare um, if that is cut that's going to harm them but they will stay they will to a, almost to a person say I need that or, or that's okay it's my fault and and those policy yeah, right so uh, I'm obviously over generalizing I don't want to do that too much um, but yes uh, legislative uh, racism is a kind of way to code racism um, and to put into practice laws and policies that harm uh, people of color, uh, divide people of color, and uh, divide working class whites from um, people of color who they share common economic interests. Yes. Ray, click your raised hand uh, image, the raised hand icon, if you'd like to make a comment or ask a question. Click your raised hand icon. Lowell, your mic is open. Hi, it, it's Lowell again. Um, I was um, at the end of the last segment, I think it was Cindy who was about to ask a question about, or thinking you were about to direct the conversation to the party having to do more work. I, I think this discussion wouldn't be totally complete about Angela Davis without understanding how the party itself shifted hugely to the right in the late from the late forties onward. Um, and I, I cite for example how it began to expel gays um, like Harry Hay. And then later on it took a very vocal position against um, black nationalists like Malcolm X and much later on with Davis herself, the party According to Fatina Affdecker's memoir of the trial, um, the party itself um, had debates about whether to expel Angela Davis because of her association with the Black Panthers and the Soul Dad Brothers. So I would, I would, I would, I would agree with what I think Cindy, I believe that was her name, um, was suggesting at the end of the last segment and that the party has a lot of introspection to do 
as well as criticism of neoliberalism and liberalism, um, but it, it has a lot of soul searching to do in terms of what it has done with these so-called marginalized communities. Um, okay, um, I, I'll leave that for um, uh, party folks to mull over and think about and um, grapple with. Um, I, I, I don't have a strong knowledge of a lot of that history, um, I, or some of the things that you cited specifically. Um, uh, but I think that in general, uh, social movements, uh, political parties, social movements, um, coalitions uh, have to. They have to, uh, and I think Davis uh, makes a strong case for centering the uh, movements of the most oppressed, um, of making them strategic aims of coalitions, of social movements, of political parties um, in a in, in their broader struggles in order to build stronger unity. And um, and I think uh, that calls for unity are um, one thing, um, but um, how to build that particular unity requires um, shifting strategic aims and thinking through how to shift strategic aims to um, address the particular needs of um, various sections of the working class. Craig, your mic is open. Hi, great talk. Thanks for doing this. Um, I just had a quick question for you about w whether, you know, in terms of oppressed peoples, um, you know, and going back to Lenin's dictate, workers and oppressed peoples of the world unite, um, could you talk about some of the problems of, you know, of ranking different groups of oppressed peoples. I mean, is the working class to assume a leadership role? Is is there, you know, when what can be described as selfish or even sectarian interests um, predominate as opposed to unifying all oppressed peoples? Um, how do you see that playing out? And is that a problem for progressive? Yeah, I think it's a, um, it's a complicated issue. Um, I think there have been really important points in history, even in U.S. history, where um, um, broad coalitions of people um, unified to win greater power uh, for the most oppressed. Um, but I don't want, I don't, I, it's hard to discuss this abstractly because um, I, it may result in sloganeering and um, those kinds of things, and I don't want to really do that. I think in the practical world of building a movement to accomplish a particular political task, a particular strategic aim, um, you have to um, build, you have to understand how different social forces in a particular place um, align, uh, what their particular interests are, what their needs are, and to understand those needs. And I, and I, and I think the um, progressive social movements like the labor movement, they have the skills um, and they have the knowledge to do these kinds of things. And I, and I you know, um, the party, other other progressive movement, social movements, coalitions, they have the skills to listen, to be able to listen to one another, to uh, identify the best ways to accomplish uh, the goals that achieve the most for the most people and so on and so forth. Um, and, and so, and, but I think in a lot of different situations, a lot of different levels, local, national, international, um, those coalitions and um, uh, movements of movements uh, emerge differently. Uh, it's hard to theorize about um, uh, all of those differences in, in, in a very general or abstract ways. But I think um, when uh, movements center the the specific needs um, place the uh, put forward the leaders who are from those communities uh, listen to one another um, and um, struggle together that they you know they do better than when they rely on sort of the most generalized or the most abstract or the most universal kinds of slogans or programs or policies because then that tends to mean that the people in those movements with the most power, the most voice, the the most time, the most uh, money, uh, have the biggest influence on the outcome. And in that way, um, various kinds of supremacies can creep into social movements. Um, 
white supremacy, male supremacy, um, uh, heteronormative supremacy can creep into those movements and those people can set the agendas. So um, I, I think um, it's an issue of listening, it's an issue of practical politics, it's an issue of um, relationship building, uh, communication, um, and being willing to put forward uh, agendas or policies that don't necessarily benefit the, the, the leader of that organization, but do benefit the most oppressed. Okay, uh, we're running out of time. Um, is there anyone else who'd like to make a comment? Uh, maybe in response to uh, Lowell, um, we, we cannot assume uh, Joel uh, Wendland, our speaker or our facilitator tonight, is not a spokesperson for the party, so it's uh, wrong to assume uh, that he is. Uh, so if there is someone online who would like to speak to the uh, comments that uh, Lowell made, then I will open your mic and allow you to do so. Um, anyone? Okay, I will say, uh, this is D speaking, I will say that uh, the question is never whether or not a debate takes place. The question is, is always what the end result of the debate is. Uh, on every question, I think we uh, should welcome debate. So the fact that uh, the issue of, and I am familiar with uh, the uh, information about during that period that uh, our uh, public, how we publicly related to Angela Davis uh, uh, was, actually, was debated uh, and the end result uh, of the debate that uh, the party would fully uh, support her and fully uh, fight for her freedom. In terms of the African-American question, when you raise uh, the issue of uh, the fight for equality and the fight for advance, uh, 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 advances in democracy, uh, even though it does not necessitate an embrace of, uh, of nationalism, especially reactionary nationalism. Uh, so I think uh, 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 we, uh, we generalize uh, too much. Uh, there are, in terms of struggles of oppressed people, there is the view that some form of forms of nationalism can be democratic, but uh, also some forms of nationalism can be anti-democratic. So all forms of nationalism are not embraced. And it does not mean moving away from uh, the fight for equality and the defense of, of those uh, and the support of those uh, 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 various uh, populations. So Joel, I just inject that. Sorry, if you want right. to make some, some summary remarks. Um, no, I just uh, want to say thank you for inviting me to speak. I really enjoyed um, the back and forth on this. Um, it seems like there's lots of questions still to address, um, and I look forward to you know, working on and researching those questions and working on them and um, thinking through some of them myself. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, everybody. Uh, let me remind you that our next uh, class is June 4th. It will be on uh, Cuba Today. And then our class after that is June 14th, and it will be on a classic work of uh, Marx. So we hope you'll join us again, and thank you all for agreeing to join us tonight. And we hope you will uh, join us in the future uh, on a topic of your choice. Thank you, and good night, everyone.